It didn't seem to work. Just crossing finger. Yep. <laughs> Looks great. Yeah, that's all good. Okay, looks like we're live on YouTube. Okay, let me just post the link and then we can get started. Jane, can you send me the link? I can't seem to find it. <laughs> oh dear. It's always... Oh, okay. Oh, it's, it's appeared now. I think it took a bit of time. Okay. Yeah, do, you, do you see my pointer, actually? Do you see the arrow? Yeah, when we I... see your pointer. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Really need to make a, a document with all the links right in front of me so I don't have to go finding them at the last second, which happens every week. <laughs> Seconds. Okay, maybe we can get started. <laughs> okay, thanks everyone for coming. This is seminar number nine, I think, in the list. Um, and today's speaker is Sandrine Etienne Manaville. Uh, Sandrine is Director of, the, of uh, Research at CNRS and heads the Department of Cellular Dynamics and Physiology and Pathology at the Institute Pasteur. Uh, Sandrine's an EMBO member and has received several awards for her work, which is focused on cell polarization and migration, especially using astrocytes as a model system. Her work has demonstrated many fundamental ideas, including that adhesion molecules and major tumor suppressors regulate polarity pathways. And more recently, she's investigated how microtubules and intermediate filaments control polarization. And today she's gonna to be talking about cytoskeletal crosstalk during cell migration. So thanks very much, Sandrine. Thank you very much, Adam and, and Jennifer for, for this fantastic uh, organization that you have and uh, allow us to, to actually follow the, the field during this period. Um, so I will be talking about cytoskeletal cross talk during migration. As, as you pointed out, we are interested in um, studying cell migration in a one specific context, which is astrocyte migration. So astrocytes are um, glial cells of the central nervous system. They fulfill many functions on which I will, um, I will pass today. But what is interesting is that in the normal brain, these cells are immobile cells. However, they can undergo migration, of course, during development, but also during pathological situation in, in the adult. Uh, this pathological situation falls in two classes, which are the astrogliosis, which is observed in response to any kind of inflammatory situation in the brain. And that induces a very limited actually migration in human. It's a very controlled collective and directed migration. In contrast, these cells, which are in fact very poorly migrating cells, can give rise to tumors, among which you find glioblastomas, which are extremely invasive, uh, which makes us wonder what are the molecular changes that actually allow these cells to become so invasive uh, during uh, oncogenesis. So to study this, we've uh, been looking, of course, at the mechanisms of cell migration. And it is clear to anyone, or everyone, I, I think, that the actin cytoskeleton play a key role in cell migration in general and in collective cell migration in particular. And just to point out a very obvious uh, role of the actin cytoskeleton in this migration is that uh, the formation of an actin meshwork at the front, really, uh, generally regulated by, uh, uh, by RAC and CDC42, at the front of uh, the leader cells induces a um, membrane protrusion and initiate cell migration and polarization. Uh, 
um, then oops, sorry, the formation of uh, stress fibers which are connected to focal adhesion is responsible for the generation of traction forces, which are obviously essential for the migration of cells which require cell adhesion, such as uh, mesenchymal cells, and astrocytes fall into this category. And in addition to this, we also observe um, interjunctional transverse arcs of actin, which link cells together through adherent junctions. And uh, these um, uh, transverse arcs of actin has really, are really necessary for the, the maintenance of adherent junctions, and by that, uh, necessary for monolayer integrity and also control of collective uh, behavior with collective polarization of the cells and collective moving. However, the actin cytoskeleton obviously is not the only um, element of the cytoskeleton. And when we're looking at cells uh, and staining um, uh, after, uh, well, with the staining of microtubules and also intermediate filaments, we can clearly notice that the three cytoskeletal network fully, um, uh, fully extend in the entire uh, cell, uh, cell cytoplasm. Uh, from the very leading edge until the, the rear of the cell. And it is really a tangled network that, that we can see here. And in addition to the actin, where you can see the protrusion at the front and also the stress fibers uh, in, in the direction of movement here, you can clearly observe that microtubule reach towards the leading edge and that the intermediate filament here in green are also elongated along these microtubules and towards the leading edge of the cell. So the three cytoskeletal elements are uh, clearly very well polarized uh, in the migrating cells. So that let us wonder what are the role of these other cytoskeletal elements. Um, so I will talk about two different aspects today. Well, the first one is the role of the intermediate filaments and how they can actually influence uh, the actin network during cell migration. And then in the second part, I will talk about the role of the microtubule network in also in the regulation of the actomyosin network during cell migration. So uh, a very quick um, summary of the properties of those intermediate or the cytoplasmic intermediate filaments. So in contrast with the actin and the microtubule network, these uh, intermediate filament form apolar polymers so there's no plus end and minus ends in this case. Um, they form also by a nucleotide, nucleotide independent assembly. It doesn't require energy for to assemble. So they kind of uh, auto polymerize uh, um, naturally in cells. And there's no known associated molecular motors, probably because they are apoly, uh, apolar and it's difficult to therefore move in a directed manner along these filaments. The other very specific characteristic of intermediate filament is that their composition uh, varies dramatically between, uh, uh, depending on the cell type. And there are more than 70 genes which encode intermediate filament proteins, and they fall in different categories. In particular, the keratins, uh, which are essential for epithelial cells, are found in, uh, and classified as type 1 and type 2. Uh, we will be focusing on, on, on intermediate filament protein that are found in astrocytes, and that includes vimentin, GFAP, uh, cinnamon, and nestin, uh, which are um, uh, associated with other intermediate filament that, uh, protein that are found in other cell types, such as desmin or neurofilament. In addition, of course, intermediate filaments also include the nuclear lamines, which are found in all cell types. So in astrocytes, as I just mentioned, uh, we can find mainly vimentin, nestin, and GFAP, uh, which are shown here. We can also see cinnamon in these cells. Um, what was interesting to observe was that these three protein, at least, vimentin, nestin, and GFAP, are really found in the same intermediate filament. So if, if you're looking at one single filament by super resolution microscopy, you can clearly observe the three distinct proteins within the same filament. That indicates that um, in terms of regulation of the network, I mean, the three protein will behave similarly um, during migration. So we were interested in intermediate filament for another reason, which is that intermediate filaments are known to be 
overexpressed in glioblastomas, in general, the composition of intermediate filaments have often been shown to correlate or to be associated with, uh, with oncogenesis. And in particular, it is well known that bimentin is expressed uh, during EMT. And uh, in glioblastomas, there is a not regulation of all three vimentin, nestin, and GFAP intermediate filament proteins. So for this reason, we wanted to know whether this overexpression of intermediate filament, in a sense, could play a role in the increased migratory ability of these cells. So we uh, took the opposite approach, which is to decrease the expression of intermediate filament protein in astrocytes and see how that affects migration. So we can do this by, um, by using uh, uh, sRNA against uh, these proteins. And we used in this case a triple sRNA against nestin, GFAP, and vimentin that decreases strongly the expression of the protein. It doesn't completely abolish the formation of a network. There are still a bit of filaments, but it is really strongly altered compared to normal situation. But you have to keep in mind that the, obs the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the results we observe are basically probably um, uh, less uh, obvious that what it would be in absence, in complete absence of intermediate filament. Now, if we're doing this and we're looking at cell migration or astrocyte migration in a wound dealing assay, this is a normal regular wound dealing in which you have an astrocyte monolayer and a scratch in the monolayer, which induces the migration of the cells perpendicularly to the initial wound. It is a very slow and um, collective and directed migration. In contrast, when we are doing this in cells in which intermediate filament protein have been downregulated, we see that the cell migration is reduced, the speed is reduced, the direction is also less precise, and the persistence of migration or of direction is, is also reduced. Uh, we've been able to show that that involves also a misregulation of the nucleus and the centrosome position. So this intermediate filament network uh, is connected to the other uh, cytoskeletal elements by different kind of linkers. And we think that these linkers are essential for the coordination of the three cytoskeletal elements. So here, as an example, I would say that between intermediate filament and actin, you will find some key um, uh, proteins such as uh, plectin, uh, which play a key role in, in, in binding both the actin cytoskeletal to the intermediate filament. And this same plectin is also essential for, inter for the interaction between the intermediate filaments and the microtubules. However, in this case, we also know that microtubule associated motors can bind to intermediate filament and actually transport them along these microtubules. So keeping this in mind, if we are looking at the organization of the intermediate filament in normal cells, we'll see that they elongate in the direction of migration. And as I pointed out on the first image and also here, these intermediate filaments are elongated along microtubules, very often we find them uh, really um, in parallel to these microtubules. And in fact, it is known, for, it's been known for a while that by treating cell with nocodazole by, and disrupting completely the microtubule network, intermediate filament completely collapse uh, around the nucleus and, and form this tangled network here around the nucleus and don't elongate anymore in the cell um, cytoplasm. So this clearly indicates that microtubules are essential We've been also able to observe this uh, association of the microtubule network with the intermediate filament uh, by super resolution microscopy, where you can clearly appreciate how intermediate filament tend to wrap around, in fact, the, the microtubules and really follow these microtubules. So during cell migration, as the microtubule um, move or extend uh, towards the, the cell leading edge, uh, as shown here, uh, you see that the intermediate filament actually follow this um, elongation of the microtubule network. So that the intermediate filament really reach towards the leading edge where the microtubules are actually growing. So uh, Cecile in the lab, uh, Cecile Ledic in the lab has shown that this uh, elongation that we observe of the intermediate filament network is in fact due to transport of long pieces of intermediate filament by um, kinase-independent transport along these microtubules. Uh, 
So microtubules during cell migration, as um, in, in any adherent cells, tend to reach towards focal adhesions. So focal adhesions, of course, are concentrated at the leading edge of migrating cells, and microtubules are reaching towards these focal adhesions, where they have been shown to uh, contribute to the regulation of the dynamics of these focal adhesions. Not surprisingly, we also find intermediate filament coming in close proximity to the focal adhesion. So it is less clear because the intermediate filaments are probably uh, less, um, well, are smaller uh, in diameter compared to microtubules and therefore uh, the resolution is, is less good, but we can clearly see that they come close to these focal adhesions. And more interestingly, we can actually co-precipitate intermediate filament protein together with focal adhesion proteins, and that includes talin and vinculin. Interestingly, plectin is also uh, associated with intermediate filament and is also present in these focal adhesions. And in fact, if we disrupt plectin or if we deplete plectin, we observe the same effect or even more uh, than what we observe uh, following depletion of intermediate filament proteins. So plectin really clear, plays a key role in, in, association, in the association of the intermediate filament with uh, the focal adhesions. Now we've been looking at this interaction between intermediate filaments and, um, and focal adhesion more closely. Um, using, uh, well, by, um, uh, we, did, we collaborated with the team of Stéphane Vassilopoulos at the Institute of Myology in, in, in Paris. And he used a technique which is an EM technique where you unroof the cells to be able to really observe the, the basal membrane which is attached to the substrate. And you can see it here appearing in gray. And you can see the end of the actin cables uh, which are reaching towards uh, the plasma membrane at the bottom of the cells and therefore are anchored uh, with, um, well, in the focal adhesions there. And when we can clearly see in these actin cables, which form these big bundles here attached to these strong focal adhesions, is that we'll see along them uh, microtubules here, which was kind of expected, but we also see many different uh, intermediate filaments here. They form this uh, more curved and, and, and smaller filament here that we can see really tangles within the actin uh, bundles. So that also confirmed the, the, the connection of the intermediate filament network with the actin cytoskeleton and the focal adhesions. So do intermediate filament affect focal adhesions? And so we tested this by using again the, the triple uh, in, uh, sRNA against intermediate filament protein. So in normal cells, uh, astrocytes, when they're migrating in a wound healing assay, you'll find that most focal adhesion really concentrate at the very leading edge of the leader cells. So first row of cells close to the wound, and here you have plenty, plenty of focal adhesions which are decorating the leading edge of the cell, and you have very little focal adhesion uh, behind, both in the protrusion of the cell and also in the followers. Now, if we are using sRNA treated cells, we'll see that they, they, we see that there are many focal adhesions, and they are not particularly concentrated at the leading edge. They really uh, are present uh, all throughout the cell uh, surface here. Uh, and uh, you'll find much, well, more, much more focal adhesion in these cells. So the number of focal adhesion is strongly increased. And clearly also their distribution along the axis of, of the migrating cell is also perturbed when, when you have a lot of focal adhesion, not only at the front, but also uh, all throughout uh, the cell protrusion and the cell surface in general. This is also true for the rear of the cell. So if you disrupt intermediate filament, you tend to, to have more focal adhesion and you can also observe this in the follower cells. So as I said before, you have very little focal adhesion in followers, uh, which are essentially moving forward because they are pulled by the leader cells uh, through adherent junctions and therefore do not adhere very much to the substrate in normal condition. However, in cells which do not have uh, much intermediate filaments, then these cells form a lot of focal adhesions. They are strongly adherent to the substrate, much more than in control situations. 
one consequence of this misregulation or alteration of the focal adhesion distribution is also an alteration of the actin cytoskeleton, uh, cytoskeleton. And if we are looking at the distribution of the actin fibers in migrating cells, we see a very strong, uh, a very big difference between control cells and um, ice RNA depleted cells or in intermediate filament depleted cells. So here in normal situation, you will find a lot of uh, actin transverse arcs or interjunctional transverse arcs, which are uh, bridging uh, cells together at the level of adherent junctions. And you also see these long um, stress fibers, uh, which are directed in the direction of the movement. In contrast, uh, when cells don't have uh, much intermediate filament, the, foc the um, focal adhesion, I said, were distributed all throughout uh, the cell surface and they seem much stronger. And this is associated with also much stronger stress fibers. And you can see plenty of these longitudinal stress fibers which are elongated in the direction of the movement. And we observe uh, almost complete dis uh, disappearance of this uh, actin transverse arcs that we normally see in, in migra or collectively migrating cells. So this increase in stress fibers led us to um, investigate whether the traction forces that were exerted on the cell substrate, on, on the substrate by the cells was altered in, in response to the depletion of intermediate filaments. So we collaborated with the team of Manuel Thierry in, in Paris, and we plated cells on micro patterns with this shape, a crossbow shape here, to investigate how much they could pull on the substrate. And what we could see was that depletion of intermediate filament really led to a strong increase in the traction forces exerted by the cell uh, on the substrate. So what we can see is that intermediate filament, when they are absent, uh, where the absence of intermediate filament leads to um, an increase in focal adhesions, an increase is in stress fibers, and also an increase in traction forces. So we wondered how this increase in traction forces could actually lead to an alteration of cell migration. So for this, um, we looked at monolayer uh, stress microscopy and we collaborated with Xavier Trepa in Barcelona to, to do this experiment. In this case, what we do is that we plate the cells in a rectangle here, which is surrounded by a PDMS membrane. The cells are plated on a gel um, in which uh, many fluorescent beads are uh, included. And we can follow the movement of the beads when the cells start to migrate upon the removal of the PDMS uh, membrane. So the cells migrate here outside of this uh, rectangle and following this migration, we can measure the traction forces throughout the cell monolayer. So here is a chymograph showing the, the intensity of the traction forces in the, in the monolayer across, here is across the uh, rectangle which was uh, initially plated here. So what you see is that over time cells are migrating out of this rectangle, so that explains what you, why it goes this way uh, in the chymograph, and at the same time you can also see that the traction forces are maximal really on, the, on, on both sides of the monolayer here, indicating that most of the traction forces are really exerted by the leader cells in this population of cells, which is an indication of a collective movement. Now, in intermediate filament depleted cells, the situation is somewhat different, uh, essentially because this the, the traction forces are not only uh, localized at the leading edge or in the leader cells, but also in the middle of the monolayer here. And this can be quantified here, where we uh, actually measured the ratio between the forces which are produced by the cells at the leading edge and the forces which are produced uh, by the cells uh, situated in, in the center of the monolayer. So what we can see is that in normal situation, more forces are exerted at the periphery, so by the leader cells, compared to the center of the monolayer. While in intermediate filament depleted cells, this is the case at the very beginning, but then the other cells start to actually produce forces and also uh, migrate using their own focal adhesions. Uh, 
However, what we see here is the forces that are generated in, in general. And what we think is that the orientation of these forces uh, might be disrupted and that the accumulation of forces within the monolayer actually perturbs the migration of the entire monolayer. Now, the other observation that we made was that the actin transverse arcs, so the, this intermediate, uh, these interjunctional arcs of actin were strongly uh, decreased or perturbed in absence of intermediate filaments. So here we can see a closer view of these transverse uh, arcs of actin, which really are connected to the adherent junctions, which are shown here in, in green. And through these adherent junctions actually connect to the uh, transverse arcs of the neighboring cells. What we've shown previously was that during cell migration, these transverse arcs are moving uh, in a retrograde manner from the front of the, of the leader cells to the back of this leader cells. So you have this beautiful retrograde flow of, of these uh, actin transverse arcs all through uh, the, the cell here. And attached to these transverse arcs are the um, adherent junctions. And as the cells are migrating forward, uh, the adherent junctions follow the same retrograde flow as the transverse arcs of actin. And what Florent in the lab uh, uh, shown previously was that this retrograde flow of adherent junction, which is really due to this retrograde flow of, of actin fibers, is really essential for the maintenance of this cell-cell uh, contact during collective migration. And that in absence of this, you progressively lose this in these adherent junctions. Uh, the cells tend to detach from one another, and that uh, eventually leads to an alteration of the polarization and the collective movement. So if we're looking now at what is happening to this uh, retrograde flow of adherent junctions in cells in which intermediate filaments have been uh, depleted, what we can see is that this uh, retrograde flow is strongly altered. It is really reduced. In some cells, we still see it. And in some cells like this one, there is actually no more retrograde flow at all of these adherent junctions. So, this is actually, as I said, something which is normally absolutely required for the maintenance of adherent junctions. And not surprisingly, if we leave the cells to migrate or if we let them migrate and we look at the state of these um, uh, adherent junctions between leader cells, we can clearly see that the depletion of intermediate filament progressively leads to a destabilization of these junctions, which appear all zigzaggy here instead of being really straight as they normally are in, 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 in migrating astrocytes. So we think this is really essential in helping the cells to, to migrate collectively, and that in absence of this maintenance of adherent junctions, there is a progressive loss of the, uh, the global polarization of the cell monolayer. So, what I want to show here is that in general, then the intermediate filaments are really connected to the other two cytoskeletal elements. So I didn't show everything concerning the organization of the or how intermediate filaments are controlled, but I've shown you that the microtubule dependent transport was essential in actually guiding intermediate filament towards the front of the cell. Uh, I've shown you that intermediate filament can control retrograde flow, but it is of, of actin. It is also important to keep in mind that, in fact, the actin retrograde flow also controls the organization of the intermediate filament. So that shows you uh, how much the connection between these two networks is tight uh, and how one can influence the other. Um, the organization of the intermediate filament uh, along the axis of migration, which depends on the microtubule network, is dependent on the CDC42 mediated signaling pathway. So it is really induced by the polarization of the cells at the leading edge of the cells. And this involves an integrin dependent signaling. Now, what I've shown you and where I, what I put the emphasis on is the fact that intermediate filament play a key role in cell migration. And they do so by interacting with focal adhesion and actually restricting their, their um, formation and their dynamics at the very leading edge of the leader cells, so that in a normal monolayer, intermediate filament restricts the generation of traction forces 
uh, really at the leading edge of the leader cells. And that makes the entire monolayer completely polarized so that it probably makes the entire uh, collective migration more efficient. In addition, these intermediate filaments are really required for the formation of interjunctional transverse arcs of actin, which are essential for the control of intercellular contact. And through this, they play a key role in controlling nucleus positioning towards the back of the cells and also uh, contribute to the orientation of the centrosome in front of the nucleus. And therefore, they play a key role in the maintenance of the collective polarity. Altogether, they facilitate collective cell migration. And we believe that an increase in intermediate filament expression will actually increase cell migration because of this. Now, concerning the second part of my talk, eh, this time we'll switch gears and we'll go towards microtubules, though I, I talked about microtubules a uh, tiny bit in the first part. And, and we'll uh, concentrate on the role of microtubules in the regulation of the actomyosin network. So whether they can actually regulate this actomyosin net network, how they do it, and as a conclusion, we'll talk about how they can contribute to mechanotransductions. So of course, microtubules have been known now for a while to play a key role in cell migration because they are important for the polarization of the cell and because they also contribute to the organization of the other cytoskeletal network. So this is due in particular to cytoskeletal crosslinking, and I've shown you one example uh, just previously of the crosslinking between intermediate filaments and microtubules and how this could guide intermediate filament towards the front of the cell. In addition, of course, microtubules play a key role in um, vesicular traffic and therefore are important to deliver membrane and uh, associated proteins to the front of the cell as the cell is protruding. Finally, another key role of the intermediate filament is that they've been shown to regulate um, um, in intracellular signaling. And in particular, they can regulate uh, small GTPases such as RAC, but also RO. Now, we know a lot about how uh, microtubules uh, actually contribute to cell migration, but uh, it is difficult to, to pinpoint how they do it. So one way we, we, we envisioned to study uh, microtubule regulation was to look at one specific type of regulation, which consists in the post-translational modifications of tubulin. So alpha and beta tubulin can be uh, heavily modified um, and among these different modifications, we focused on one particular one, which is the acetylation. So acetylation occurs on lysine 40, which is situated on, in the luminal side of the microtubule, on the alpha tubule. We focused on this particular modification because if we're looking again in glioblastoma, what we observe is that there's a clear uh, uh, decrease in acetylation of uh, microtubules in these cells, at least in the cells that we've been studying for the moment. So we wondered whether acetylation, once again, could play a role in uh, the regulation of migration. So first we looked at how um, this acetylation was regulated during migration. And one way to do so was to play cells, let them migrate for eight hours and look at how the acetylation of microtubule was changing upon migration. And what we observed was that during the time of migration, there is a clear increase in the level of uh, acetylated tubulin during migration. Interestingly, we, we tested at the same time whether detyrosination of um, tubulin was also occurring during, during um, this event. Why? Because it's been known for, well, it's been thought actually for a long time that acetylation and detyrosination were two modifications associated with long-lived microtubules and that both of them were co-regulated. Uh, here we have a beautiful example that shows that there's no co-regulation of these two modifications. Indeed, while the acetylation is increasing during cell migration, in fact, detyrosination is decreasing in astrocytes, clearly indicating that they are not coupled, but really are regulated by different mechanisms. Now, if we're looking at um, uh, acetylation, acetylated microtubules in migrating cells, we'll see a bunch of them really in the center of the cells here. And these really correspond to these long-lived and, and very resistant um, 
uh, microtubules. So if you treat cells with nocodazole, for instance, for a long time, you will keep these tangled microtubules here, which are close to the um, Golgi region of, of the cell, so in front of the nucleus, but also around the nucleus. But in addition to this, if we're looking more carefully at this uh, staining here, we'll see that there are dashes of uh, acetylated microtubules close to focal adhesions. In regions where you don't have focal adhesion, you see very little uh, acetylation of the microtubule. So we looked at this uh, more carefully by wondering whether the acetylation of uh, the microtubule network could be linked to uh, integrin signaling and focal adhesion dynamics. And indeed, if we are blocking uh, cell adhesion or integrin signaling either by using uh, RGD peptides or by treating cells with uh, sRNA against beta-1 integrin, we see a strong decrease in the acetylation of microtubules. So that clearly indicates that the acetylation of microtubules is increasing during migration, and this occurs as a response to the integrin signaling cascade. Now, how does it occur? We know that there are enzymes which regulate microtubule acetylation, and in particular, there is an alpha-tubulin uh, um, acetylase uh, enzyme, uh, alpha-tat1, which regulate the addition of the acetyl group on alpha-tubulin. Alpha in contrast, there are deacetylases, and in astrocytes in particular, it's HDAC6, which is the main acetylase. So what is interesting here is that while Ashdexis has many different uh, substrates, well, so it's not only alpha-tubulin, ATAT1, up to now at least, is only known to have one substrate, which is alpha-tubulin. So by depleting ATAT1, uh, we believe that we are essentially affecting the acetylation of microtubules, and at least for the moment, we don't know of any other targets that could be affected by this downregulation of ATAT1. Now, if we downregulate ATAT1, we completely block microtubule acetylation, or almost completely. There's uh, barely any acetylation left, only a little bit in these very long-lived microtubules, which have a very slow turnover and apparently are difficult to get rid of. The microtubule network, however, still is still intact. So we still have microtubules in these cells. It's not as if we have completely disrupted it with nocodazole or something like this. No, the microtubules are still intact. However, they are not acetylated as they should be. So we can uh, rescue the acetylation in a sense by using tubacin, which is an inhibitor of ashdaxis, and this will lead to an increased acetylation again. So even if we don't have that one, if we add uh, um, tubacin, we will rescue the level of acetylation by inhibiting the deacetylase. Now, since I've said that the acetylation of microtubules seem to be regulated by uh, um, a beta-1 signaling, we wondered whether ATAT1 could be somehow associated with focal adhesion. And what we initially did was uh, to perform a mass spect uh, analysis of uh, the interactors of ATAT1. And in this uh, mass spec analysis, Tallinn came out as the first hit. So here, what we did was a co-immunoprecipitation where we confirm that indeed talin strongly interact with ATAT1. Now, if we're looking at ATAT1 by immunofluorescence, or in this case, uh, GFP ATAT1, uh, when we look at it, essentially we see a lot of ATAT1 in microtubules that you can see here by epifluorescence, but you can also see some big dashes here which are reminiscent to focal adhesion. Now, if we're using turf microscopy to really focus on the basal side of the cells, uh, we can clearly see that ATAT1 is really enriched in this region here, which corresponds to focal adhesion and the area which is around focal adhesion and usually where microtubules are associated. So this really indicates that ATAT1 can associate with uh, focal adhesion and therefore might be regulated by integrin signaling at this site. Now, what is happening at focal additions if we remove ATAT1 from the cells and if we decrease uh, microtubule acetylation? So here, as I said previously, the focal additions in normal cells are located essentially at the leading edge of the cell here, so that you can find focal addition at the leading edge, but within the protrusions, there are barely any focal addition. In contrast, in cells in which you don't have uh, this ATAT1 and therefore you don't have microtubule acetylation, 
you'll find focal adhesions at the front here. They seem a bit smaller, but they're there. Uh, and there are many of them, and there are also many of them uh, further back in the protrusion here. And essentially, everywhere where you don't have any uh, uh, microtubule acetylation, uh, you'll find this, this focal adhesion here. In this region here, close to the nucleus, where you have some reminiscence of, of uh, acetylated uh, tubulin, you'll find less focal adhesions. So here, what we did was to quantify. So the focal addition number you see is increasing in absence of ATAT1, so in absence of microtubule acetylation. This is shown here with another sRNA. And now, if we re-express ATAT1 in these cells, we can rescue uh, the number of focal addition to an almost normal level. And, and in contrast, if we are using an ATAT1, which uh, is catalytically dead, uh, then this construct doesn't rescue uh, the focal addition number. So the number are, uh, is altered, but also the distribution is altered. So microtubules uh, acetylation clearly affects uh, uh, this uh, organization of the, uh, the focal adhesions. And when we are looking at migrating cells, the other things that appears obviously is the, the dynamics uh, of um, focal adhesions. So, in regular cells, in normal cells, the focal adhesions are turning over very quickly, actually, at the leading edge of these cells. And that maintains this continuous focal adhesion, well, continuous uh, concentration of focal adhesion at the leading edge of the cells. In contrast, in the cells uh, which, in which ATAT1 has been depleted, the focal adhesion turnover is much slower. And therefore, you keep these focal adhesion for a long time is within this protrusion. And that explains why we see so many focal adhesions and throughout this um, protrusion. Uh, so here is the focal adhesion lifetime, which is strongly increased. What we've been also able to show was that this increased lifetime is actually due for once to, to a slower formation of the focal adhesion. In addition to that, you have also a slower um, uh, destabilization or disassembly of the focal adhesion. And finally, this focal adhesion tend to stay for a given time, for more, much longer actually than in normal situation at their maximum length. So they don't decrease or increase for a long time. So the entire dynamics of this uh, focal adhesion is altered. So the Regulation of focal adhesion by microtubules has been coupled to different aspects. And one of them is really the delivery of vesicles towards focal adhesion or the endocytosis, or uh, sorry, endocytosis of vesicles from focal adhesion, both exocytosis and endocytosis being able to actually regulate uh, focal adhesion dynamics. So for this, we've looked at the organization or the delivery of vesicles um, towards the leading edge of the cells. We collaborated with the team of Bruno Good in, in um, Institut Curie uh, to follow the RAP6 vesicles, which are coming from the Golgi apparatus, and uh, go towards the leading edge of the cells along microtubules. In normal situation, these vesicles end up close to focal adhesions. And what we see by using this uh, chemograph here is that when they reach focal adhesion, they tend to disappear, probably indicating that they're fusing with uh, the plasma membrane close to this focal adhesion as expected. Now in cells in which ATAT1 has been depleted and microtubule ac uh, acetylation is decreased, the behavior of these uh, RAP6 vesicle is uh, different they're still moving along microtubules relatively normally, as far as we could tell. But it seems that when they reach uh, focal adhesions, they don't disappear as they were doing in, uh, in normal cells, but they tend to stay there for a long time and sometimes even go again in the other direction. So we quantified this, and really this shows that the event of what we think is fusions uh, are really uh, decreased in absence of acetylation of microtubules. And the time during which the, the vesicles actually come to the focal adhesion and stay there without being able to fuse with the plasma membrane is much longer in this case. And we believe that this contributes to the slower turnover of the focal adhesions. So indeed, if we deplete RAP6 from the cells, we observe the same type of phenotype concerning the localization of focal adhesions, 
and the number of focal adhesions. So in absence of RAP6, you also see an increased uh, focal adhesion number and also an increased distance between the leading edge, the front of the leading edge and, and the position of the focal adhesion within the cells, which is really reminiscent of what we observe in absence of uh, microtubular acetylation. So indicating that there's a coupling of these two events of RAP6 delivery, no, uh, delivery of RAP6 positive vesicles and microtubular acetylation. Now, what's happening to the actin network in this condition? So we used again this uh, EM technique using uh, cells and roofing, uh, where we could see, uh, as I shown you before, the actin cables coming in uh, close to the plasma membrane at focal adhesion and where they are untangled with the intermediate filament network, uh, where you can also see normally uh, microtubules running along these uh, actin cables. Now, in absence of ATAT1, the situation is completely different. And we were really surprised to find that there were some actin cables coming uh, close to the leading edge. However, these actin cables are completely bare, both of microtubules and intermediate filaments. So these actin cables seem really very thin here compared to the strong actin uh, stress fibers that we could, we could see uh, in control situation. So indicating that there is a, uh, uh, really an alteration of the formation of the regular uh, uh, actin and intermediate filament connection with the uh, focal adhesion in absence of microtubule acetylation. And indeed, if we're looking now at the organization of the actin network in these cells, we also see a strong perturbation of this actin network, which is somehow reminiscent of what we observed in absence of intermediate filament. And this makes sense because in this situation, indeed intermediate filaments are disconnected apparently from focal adhesions. So similarly, as in uh, intermediate filament depleted cells, uh, there's um, some actin cables, but these actin cables are only at the back of the cells in this case, and we don't see any transverse arcs of actin here. The uh, myosin network, however, is completely different in this case. So in this case, when we're looking at the phosphorylation of myosin, instead of seeing an increase as we did with uh, intermediate filament depletion here, um, where we could see an increase, sorry, in depletion of intermediate filament, here we see a strong decrease in the phosphorylation of myosin light chain in cells in which ATAT1 has been depleted. So in absence of uh, microtubular acetylation, there is much less uh, phosphorylation of myosin light chain, indicating that the stress fibers are maybe producing less forces. So how can this be the case or why are the stress fibers altered in this situation? Then uh, we looked at the regulation of the uh, uh, GTPA's uh, regulator, which is GFH1. So GFH1 is a, uh, a GEF for Rho, so an activator for the small GTPS Rho, which is responsible for the formation of stress fibers. And what we could see was that uh, depletion of ATAT1 uh, changed the localization of GFH1. So GFH1, when localized on microtubule, is thought to be inactive and not being able to regulate or to actively or uh, activate uh, uh, Rho activity. Uh, and apparently, the de de decrease in microtubule acetylation actually uh, leads to an, an association of GFH1 with microtubules, and this would lead to a decrease in row activity. In contrast, in cells, uh, normal cells, GFH1 is only partially associated with microtubules. There's a lot of GFH1 which is not associated with microtubules, and this GFH1 is the active one, able to activate Raw and facilitate actomyosin contractility. So this has been quantified here by Shaila Jha. And what she then showed was that indeed we see an impact of uh, ATAT1 and of microtubule acetylation on raw activity by using a pull down with a, a GST rotating RBD, which uh, pulls down specifically the active form, so raw GTP, the active form of raw. And in this case, what you see is that the depletion of ATAT1 leads to a strong decrease in the activity of Rho, which really goes together with the fact that GFH1 in this condition is associated with microtubules. So that would indicate that the acetylation of microtubule is able to dis 
or to, to change the localization of the FH1, which then becomes soluble and able to activate Rho in this case. So in addition to that, uh, this increase or uh, these changes in Rho activity and actomyosin contractility is also associated with a change in the actomyosin or the traction forces, actomyosin mediated traction forces on the substrate. And in absence of microtubular acetylation, you have less traction forces exerted on the substrate. In contrast, if you increase microtubular acetylation by re-expressing at that one or over-expressing at that one, there is an increase in the traction forces that are exerted on the substrate. So this modulation of the uh, traction forces uh, is uh, probably at least partially responsible to the regulation of cell migration. And indeed, in absence of that at one, the migration of the cells is reduced. Uh, as you can see in, in this particular experiment here. So this led us to another question, which is how this role of the microtubule on focal adhesion may play also a role in uh, uh, mechanotransduction. It is known now that uh, uh, the integrins can uh, regulate or can, can be sensitive to the rigidity of the substrate and by a mechanosensing, uh, mechanosensing mechanism, can induce a signaling pathway that can affect gene expression, but also regulate the cytoskeleton so that it controls the traction forces uh, uh, exerted on the substrate. Of course, here, uh, since the microtubule seems to be involved uh, and regulated by integrin uh, mediated signaling and also be important for the regulation of traction forces, we wondered whether they might be involved in mechanotransduction. So are microtubules affected by substrate rigidity? And in particular, is microtubule acetylation affected by, micro, by substrate rigidity? And can they modulate the mechanosensitive cellular processes, such as the distribution of focal adhesions or uh, cell migration? So here is an experiment in which uh, Shail Aja in the lab uh, uh, plated cells on substrate of different rigidities and observed the acetylation level uh, in, on the microtubules. And she clearly saw that with the increased stiffness of the substrate, there is an increased uh, acetylation of microtubules. In contrast, the deterioration of tubulin is not affected by the changes in substrate rigidity. Now, these changes in, in the acetylation of, um, of microtubule following uh, plating on rigid substrate can be also abolished when uh, cells are treated with a rock inhibitor, which uh, prevents um, uh, mechanosensing. So in this case, there is a strong regulation of uh, microtubule acetylation. Now, substrate rigidity affects the localization of focal adhesion. It has been shown in different cells. And here in astrocytes, it's also the case. So in soft substrate, most of the focal, well, soft, uh, on soft substrate, focal adhesion are really distributed throughout the cell surface, both at the periphery, but also at the center of the cells. In contrast, when cells are plated on stiffer substrate, we can observe that most of the focal adhesion are at the cell periphery. Now, uh, if we are looking here at the number of focal adhesion at the cell or near the cell center, we can clearly see a decrease of this focal adhesion uh, when the, when the um, substrate rigidity increases. Now, if we are modulating uh, the acetylation of microtubules, this can change completely. So indeed, if we are splitting the cells on rigid substrate, where normally most of the focal adhesion at, are at the cell periphery, and now that we're depleting uh, at that one and reducing microtubule acetylation, then the number of focal adhesion at the cell center increases dramatically. And this then becomes similar to what we observe on soft substrate. So the cells depleted of at that one, so with no regulation of the, uh, the acetylation of microtubule and with a low level of acetylation, really behave as if they were plated on soft substrate. In contrast, if we plate cells on soft substrate, in normal situation, you'll have plenty of focal adhesion in the cell center. Now, if you increase acetylation in this condition, you decrease the number of focal adhesion in the cell center so that the cells have barely any focal adhesion in the cell center. And that really recapitulate what is observed when cells are plated on, a, on stiffer substrate. So basically, more acetylation 
more acetylation, the focal adhesions are located at the cell periphery, and that corresponds to a situation in which cells are plated on a CTIF substrate. Now, what is happening in terms of cell migration? So we know that cell migration is affected by, in general, by the rigidity of the substrate. In case of astrocytes, we are thinking about cells which are migrating in the brain, which is a very soft tissue. And therefore, we had to, uh, to make a way to have these cells migrating uh, on, um, on a soft uh, substrate. In this case, what we did, uh, so Sheila Jatt, together with Baptiste, uh, did a chemical-induced uh, uh, wound dealing. So in this case, they use a micropipette to, in, to put a very high, uh, concentrate, highly concentrated uh, drop of, of um, uh, sodium hydroxide on the, on the cells, and that induces immediately a hole in the monolayer, uh, and then the cell will migrate inside this hole. And we can assess migration this way, and we can do this on different types of substrates, so soft towards stiffer substrate. And what we can see, as in many other cell types, actually, is that the cell migration increases uh, as the cell migrate on stiffer substrate. Now, what is happening if we prevent microtubule acetylation, which normally occurs on stiffer substrate? If we are looking at soft substrate, there is no difference. Cells migrate, in fact, as well, with or without at, uh, at that one. So the microtubule acetylation is always low, both in control cells and in SC and in attack depleted cells, and migration is relatively slow. In contrast, on stiffer substrate, migration is faster in control cells, but is not faster in ATAT1 depleted cells, indicating here that microtubule acetylation actually plays a key role in regulating this mechanosensitivity of cell migration. So with this, I'd like just to conclude on the role of microtubule acetylation uh, in, in the regulation of migration in, in the regulation of the other cytoskeletal network. So what we think is happening is that on stiff, sub on stiff substrate, microtubules are acetylated, and this regulation of microtubule acetylation leads to a faster turnover of focal adhesion, possibly due to this uh, um, vesicular, increased vesicular fusion at focal adhesions. And in addition, it is also associated with an increased row activity, which leads to stronger traction forces exerted on focal adhesion, traction forces which may also affect the turnover of focal adhesion, of course. And all this together leads to a faster migration. In contrast, on soft substrate, there's no acetylation. The dynamics of focal adhesion is slower and the traction forces exerted on this focal adhesion is also, uh, they are also slow, uh, smaller, meaning that the migration gets uh, slower as well. So altogether, I hope that this uh, seminar convinced you that there are very uh, uh, tight crosstalk between the different cytoskeletal elements. I've shown you in the, pre uh, in the initial part that actomyosin were controlled by or was controlled by the intermediate filament. I showed you also in the second part that microtubule played also a key role in regulating the actomyosin network. You have to keep in mind that, of course, all this regulation goes both ways and that the actomyosin network play a key role in regulating intermediate filament and microtubules, and also that microtubules and intermediate filament talk to each other so that, they, um, so that the migration occurs in a very um, uh, correct way with all of the cytoskeleton uh, being coordinated during migration. And with this, I'd like to thank all the people who did the work, uh, the lab uh, here, um, uh, quite a few months ago, actually, because uh, obviously it has been changing a bit these different, uh, uh, during these different months. Um, however, people who did the work here, so concerning intermediate uh, filament, it's been um, a work by uh, uh, Chiara and uh, uh, Cecile, and now uh, Gael and Emma are working on this. And uh, for the microtubule network, it's work initiated by Bertie, uh, Bertie Benz and now by uh, Shaila Jha in the lab. And I thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to take questions. Thanks very much, Sandrin. That was fantastic. Uh, if anyone wants like to unmute and give an applause, please do. Uh, just a reminder for everyone, if you're on YouTube, uh, you can put questions in the chat, and if you're on Zoom, you can do the same, or you can write the word question, and we can ask you to unmute, and then you can ask it yourself. Uh, so we'll stop.
start going through the questions. So um, Ankita Ja asks, does the length of protrusions to the lamellopodia increase in leader cells in the triple intermediate filament siRNA? Does it increase? It's they are not longer. No, they tend to be thinner, but they are uh, thinner in width. But but they they are not really longer. No, they they keep about the same size as in in, in normal cells. Okay, uh, we have two questions from Gareth Jones. Um, is the half life of focal adhesions increased in the IF depleted cells, and is this why you see so many focal adhesions? Yes, the half life is increased. The turnover is slower. Yes. Okay, and um, is it a coincidence that the ATAT1 depleted cells have many focal adhesions, just like the IF depleted cells, or is there a functional link between the two cytoskeletal moieties? So we think there is a functional link, and actually, when you deplete ATAT1, intermediate filament disappear from focal adhesions. So that could be one link, but however, we don't know exactly how it works. Uh, so I would say that by depleting or no, by depleting ATAT1 and reducing uh, microtubular acetylation, you uncouple the intermediate filaments from focal adhesions. Now you have additional role of microtubular acetylation, which do not depend on the on, on intermediate filaments and regulate it differently, but a part of the phenotype is probably due to the fact that you, de you detach intermediate filament from focal adhesions. Yeah. Um, on YouTube, so Yali is asking, says, great talk. Since plectin knockdown and RAB6A knockdown give similar focal adhesion phenotypes, I was wondering if plectin interacts with exocytosis machinery as well. It's a good question. I don't know. We haven't looked at that. I don't know. Uh, the fact is that depletion of plectin is really strong phenotype, so it's much stronger than the intermediate filament. It's exactly the same type of phenotype um, in terms of focal adhesion distribution, etc. It looks the same, but uh, in this case, protrusions are very thin, uh, so elongated, not more, as I said, but, but very narrow. The actin cytoskeleton is really perturbed. It's, it's difficult to exactly assess uh, how the micro uh, the how the yeah how the the traffic is regulated uh, yeah in this condition. Okay, thanks. Um, Yutaka asks if the follower astrocytes are not producing traction forces, is it really collective cell migration? Aren't the followers in fact uh, just ignorant of the migration cue? They're not changing their behavior before and after the start of the movement of the leader cells. Um, this would be in contrast to the MDCK epithelial sheets where mm -hmm. the followers do produce traction forces um, and they behave differently from the cells which haven't yet started migration. So uh, to, to them, the IF uh, knockdown cells look, um, they're, the IF knockdown cells look more like MDCK-like collective cell movement as opposed to the wild type. Well, uh, yes, so it's a long question. Um, <laughs> um, so yes, I see the point. So uh, essentially, yes, in astrocyte migration, when they're migrating in a collective manner, the front row, uh, the leader cells are really producing all the forces. Now, once the cell are migrating, the leader cells are migrating, the second row do polarize and migrate in the same direction as the leader cells. So they do move. They do move, but uh, we believe that most of the forces are really due to these actin cables that connect the cells to adherent junctions. So indeed, it is different from epithelial cells in a sense. Uh, so yes, when we don't have intermediate filaments, but obviously where intermediate filaments are not, these intermediate filaments are not present in, in epithelial cells. So maybe by getting rid of vimentin or NGFAP and something, we are getting closer to what was happening in, in, in epithelial cells. I don't know. I don't think we're transforming astrocytes in epithelial cells also. Yeah, so when when people started to do scratch assay and the MTOC uh, relocalization, like your cell paper, they mm -hmm. just uh, took care of leading edge and uh, thought, yeah, of course. they thought follower cells don't care. But uh, I'm, I'm wondering if they actually changing behavior after removing PDMF. So if you see uh, astrocyte sheets before and uh, without lifting PDMF, uh, the barrier, 
so the behavior of sales there and the behavior of the follower sales after lifting, any difference? So we didn't do it on this particular experiment. We did it in the wound dealing essay. In the wound dealing essay, when the first row of cell start polarizing, the second row doesn't polarize immediately. It needs time for the first row of cells to start moving so that the second row start polarizing. And then it goes on and on. So you need more and more migration so that the next cells are migrating. So there are several explanations possible for this. There was a beautiful paper uh, in endothelial cells showing that you need the cells to have some kind of uh, finger-like protrusions, which are probably cadherin mediated, uh, well, which are cadherin mediated, and that actually induces polarization of the cells by inducing CDC42 or RAC activity mm -hmm. at the leading edge or the front edge of the, um, of the followers. Uh, another option is that what we see actually in astrocytes is that as the first row of cells really migrate away, it creates tension between the follow the leaders and the second row. And, and there you'll have some mini holes, basically. It could be that you have an increased integrin signaling in this place. It's not obvious because we don't see big focal adhesion developing or things like this, but it could contribute also to polarization. I see. So maybe in, oh, okay, I would spend too much time. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Um so Amrinda says, thanks for the nice talk. Uh, two questions. The first one, in first part of inter intermediate filament not down, what is the thought behind the reason for increase in number of focal adhesions? Are cells compensating for contractility? A tough question. I don't exactly know uh, why we have more focal adhesion. My guess is that it's because we have less turnover and as we said maybe it's because there is also an alteration of vesicular traffic through microtubules in this condition it could be something like this it could be that having more uh, well the reorganization of the actin network in general leads to an increase in in, in focal adhesion I, at least i don't know or maintenance rather or maintenance of focal adhesion for a longer time so we think that also the the stabilization of the actomyosin network or those stronger forces probably leads to a, a longer half-life of, of focal adhesion which would explain the number of focal adhesion which is increased okay and the second question is for both parts of the study what are your thoughts on how things will change when studies are extended to 3d examples in gels or fibrillar environments in which there is debate and differences in organization of stress fibers and focal adhesions? Uh, okay, so in 3D, so uh, depending on which 3D we're talking about, um, if we are talking about a very soft 3D gel, uh, astrocytes won't migrate essentially. So my guess is that uh, everything will be um, stuck possibly because there's no microtubular acetylation then in astrocytes and they can't migrate on soft or they can't produce enough forces to migrate in this condition now if we if you make it more rigid or more stiff uh, then it, it it becomes about the same at, at least the things that we can see uh, look the same so even if we're looking in vivo sometimes we've been looking uh, recently in, in, in zebra fish uh, in the brain when we can put, so in this case, it's glioblastoma cells migrating in the brain of, of the zebra fish, we'll see focal adhesion forming. Uh, there, there is a reorganization of the actin network. It's difficult to know now whether we can exactly apply this particular finding in this situation. I, I hope we'll be able to do so, but it's not done yet. Thanks. Um, Shin Lee asks, does acetylation change the microtubular, micro, microtubule or actin filament assembly or disassembly dynamics? Uh, microtubule dynamics then. Um, people have studied this. We haven't. People, people have looked at it. I don't think there's any clear evidence that it changes the, the, the dynamics at the plus ends of microtubules. Um, no, however, if you change the dynamics or if you change the microtubule plus N proteins or if you affect them, then you have an effect on microtubular acetylation. So there, there might be a leak, but not in a, well, there's no obvious link in the sense that if you disrupt uh, 
microtubular acetylation, there's no clear evidence that the dynamics of microtubules is strongly altered. And in our hand, we didn't find mm, anything really obvious, no. We followed only e EB1 GFP, but we didn't see any obvious changes. Next question is nameless. It says, great talk. Uh, what is the microtubule dynamics like in the control and SI at, at depleted cells at the leading edge? Yeah, same type of question then. It's similar, really. The dynamics at the leading edge is similar. Um, there is a slight, there might be a slight change in the orientation of, of, of the microtubules. It's really, really very slight. I, I don't have any, no, there's nothing obvious really. Thanks. Alessandra Camby asks, um, oh, great talk, thank you. Um, are the intermediate filaments post-translationally modified and does this influence the interaction with other cytoskeletal systems? Oh, yes and yes. Uh, they can be post-translationally modified by many different things, including acetylation, but essentially, phosphor well, what is best known for the moment is, is uh, sorry, uh, phosphorylation. <laughs> Uh, so phosphorylation of intermediate filament has been shown and there are many different sites actually. Only Vimentin, I think, has something like 60 different residues that can be phosphorylated. So that gives you a little idea of how much changes you can have on these. Um, whether that affects, it's known to affect their interaction with other proteins, so signaling proteins in particular. Um, whether it affects their interaction with other cytoskeletal elements, I don't know. For the moment, I don't know. What we also know, though, is that uh, phosphorylation tends to destabilize or restabilize intermediate filaments, so it regulates their polymerization, basically. So that would, in a sense, regulate their interaction with other cytoskeletal elements, of course. I think this is the last question, so if anyone has anything else they'd like to ask, uh, pop it in the chat. Otherwise, maybe Taka can come back and follow up on his first question. So um, this one's from uh, Camilla Ceruti asking, is it possible that astrocyte plated alone in or on soft matrix do not move because it is missing the neurovascular units? Um, it's a, a complicated question. Yes, <laughs> it's a good question though. Uh, um, so, they are not migrating on soft substrate. Um, having blood vessels around would probably help them migrating. I don't know whether it's because it would create a specific, uh, let's say, biochemical environment, or whether it's because it's going to create a specific uh, mechanical environment, because blood vessels, we think, are probably uh, stiffer than the rest, and that, for instance, glioblastoma cells tend to migrate along the blood vessels. So it could, yeah, it. It is likely to affect the migration of astrocytes in a soft substrate. We've never put them together, so I don't know. And uh, I think maybe this will be our last question. Um, Amrinder, do you want to ask your uh, your very important question? Uh, do you want to ask yourself? Uh, well, very nice talk. And uh, I would like to ask you, is there a hidden message for us to figure out in your lab, GIF? Everyone seems to be doing some remarkable things. You some of that? them are coordinated, some of them are not. Yeah, yeah. Is I, I'm trying. I'm... Or acetylation that you want us to figure out? <laughs> I'm trying to have a collective uh, behavior here. It's it's difficult. You... <laughs> We've tried, but it's, it was difficult. Okay, everybody I figured wants it out. his own, but everybody has to be different. So that's good, actually. It's each All right, so there is a message for us. So that's good. Yes, somehow. <laughs> All right, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Um, Adam, I think you said you have one more question from uh, YouTube that you want to ask. Oh, and then there's can... another one on Zoom. Are you okay for two more questions, Sandra? Is that it's okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> Late question. So this one from YouTube is from Ashwiraya. Sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong. Nice talk. If you shift the studies to a cell line with less migratory capacity, do you think increase in tubulin acetylation would increase the migration? Uh, first, it's going to be difficult to find a cell line that migrates less than astrocyte. They're really the slowest on earth. I think we can try to compete. However, <laughs> if we were to increase migration, would acetylation increase it? Um, 
I'm not so sure. Um, uh, it's um, we don't see any increase of the migration speed when we increase acetylation of microtubules. Uh, I mean, except for the rigid substrate thing. Uh, but if we are on a rigid substrate and cells are already migrating and we increase acetylation, we don't see higher, uh, faster migration as far as we can tell. But we also, to do so, we usually use tubacin, which inhibits uh, ashdaxis, which has other targets than microtubules. So I'm not sure that this actually exactly answered the question. Um, we would have to overexpress at that and see whether that increases migration. Um, I can't recall that it does. Okay, thank you. So I think our last question now from Zoom, uh, sort of a general, I guess, big picture question, mm -hmm. um, which is what do you think the role of the microtubule flexibility could be? Ah, that's an interesting thing. Um, well, so the so what we think is that well, one of the hypotheses we had was that the acetylation could make the microtubule either more flexible or more resilient to bending, which probably somehow was well, somewhat the same. So, and that's important because we know that clear near focal adhesions, when microtubules are reaching towards focal adhesions, we know that they're bent. So we've published this in a G, G, cell, sign, uh, G cell biology paper a few years ago. And, and microtubules are actually bent uh, very strongly close to focal adhesions. And what we think is that maybe acetylation here is either a consequence or uh, something which is necessary for this microtubule to, to bend this way and to stay anchored thereby to, to focal adhesions. So I think it's very important to have this, uh, well, to be able to control this flexibility of the, of the micro tools and that somehow by, when you have more traction forces on, on focal adhesion, maybe then having also more flexibility or more resilience of the micro tools in this situation is important to maintain the contact between micro tools and focal adhesions. All right, great. I think that's um, our last question. Thank you so much for, for a wonderful talk. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you very, you very much, much again to everyone. Thank you.